what I would like to talk about is from a technical perspective, what exactly are the possible implications of bridges like that and what are possible reasons for it. So at this time, the information that we know about the cause of this uh, um, bridge is actually quite limited. We don't know exactly what are the reasons that cause the system to be free to be hacked into and the data to be disclosed. But if you look at the rumors, like uh, you know, comments provided by a security analyst from Gardner, it seems to be that a payment aggregator who is responsible for aggregating uh, credit card payments for uh, a lot of uh, uh, cab companies in New York. New York City actually has a administrative account being compromised, not through any fancy technology, but because the adversary was able to correctly answer the knowledge-based authentication questions like many of you may have on your email accounts. So this coupled with uh, this kind of a coincidence that uh, global payments happen to move is uh, services from locally host to a cloud provider, which is Amazon EC2, in this case just a few months ago. And this company, which provides this payment aggregation service for NYC tabs, also happened to provide end-to-end -end encryption for um, you know, the authentication between global payments and these uh, cloud service providers. So it may be just sheer coincidence, it may not be the actual reason why this breach <coughs> actually happened, but if you connect all the dust together, it seems like a reasonable story that this may be the cause of the attack. Of course, we don't know now. So what I would like to comment on is if this were actually the cause of the attack, even if it isn't, it still tells us something about the current practice of all the different authentication services and what are the potential implications of similar attacks in the future. Um, this is one, and the other thing I want to talk about is uh, what are the implications of all these breaches on the internet from the data repositories, what an adversary can do with all the disclosed data. So for the first point, uh, if you look at the uh, uh, authentication services being breached hypothetically in this case, it's just because an adversary is able to answer the knowledge-based authentication. This basically tells us two things. One is uh, knowledge-based authentication perhaps is not a really good idea. If not for other reasons, just because of the amount of information that people can find about you on the web. So I guess a lot of you might uh, actually try to search your name on the web, and if you actually dig a little deeper and find a lot of data sources that have information about you, actually there is an amazing amount of information someone can infer about you on the internet. So setting up some knowledge-based authentication questions like uh, uh, which high school you attended, which city you got married in, isn't really a very safe question. A lot of people will be able to answer those questions just by looking for your information on the web. This is one thing. And second is, if you look at the authentication uh, services provided for a lot of users. There seems, seems to be a trend now that the regular user accounts have stricter and stricter requirements on what kind of passwords you have to set, what kind of questions you have to answer for past knowledge based on sanitation. In contrast, the regulations or the, the uh, constraints on administrative accounts is loser and loser. They do not enforce the same kind of regulations that regular account holders would have to follow. You may be wondering why, because these administrative accounts are often shared by multiple users. It's not that only one user has one account. Multiple users may have to access the same account to get business done. And this is actually, uh, this problem is actually made worse by the trend of moving a lot of services from locally hosted to a cloud provider. Because it's one thing that you pick up your phone, call the IT department, and say, I lost my password, they reset it for me so I can log into the system. It's a totally other issue that you have to call a cloud service provider and then convince the cloud service provider you are who you claim you are and then get your password reset. So in a lot of these cases, when the services are based on cloud, these cloud service providers do not provide you with very complicated authentication services. Instead, what happens here, like possibly in this case, 
is some simple knowledge-based authentication questions are used to reset the password, as well as in other words, we can somehow get answers to those questions, the accounts get compromised. So that, of course, is not a fact that we know, it's only a speculation at this time, but uh, it tells us some uh, alarming trend that may be happening, especially with the moving of uh, IT services to the cloud, and uh, that's the issue that perhaps have to be addressed by um, technical community in, in the sense that new authentication services may have to uh, receive a lot of attention from the academic community and the research community in general, as well as from other perspectives, business and legal perspectives. So the second thing I want to talk about is what exactly are the implications of having all these data disclosed to potential adversaries. So in this particular case, like Howard just mentioned, only the track two data is disclosed, which means hopefully based on the knowledge, based on the facts that we know, the uh, account holder's name, um, address, and other social security number, other information are not actually disclosed to the adversary. So it seemingly decides you have to reset your uh, credit card, change to another credit card number, there's not much information about you being disclosed in this case. But I think the real danger happening with all the breaches is not really what an adversary can do with just one bunch of data records that are breached or disclosed in one instance, but rather with a lot of other auxiliary data sources, either already available on the web or being breached in multiple instances. How an adversary can actually connect the dots together and infer a lot more serious information about you that you yourself might not even know. In this case, uh, uh, the, the database research community, for example, uh, have studied this for quite some time on how one can connect the dots from multiple data sources to infer some information about you that you think is not available. For example, the fir um, some of the very first uh, uh, studies on this issue was uh, um, by uh, Sweeney and company in uh, Massachusetts. So what they did was they looked at one public data source, which is the uh, health insurance benefits of all the state employees of Massachusetts. In that data source, there's no personal identifiable information disclosed. So you cannot see what is the uh, name of a personal social security number. All of that were, were must because of the concerns on uh, privacy because health is very sensitive information. The only information available over there were the zip code, the date of birth, and the gender of a person along with other health insurance information. Now, what this research group did was to take that data source and then crunch the data with another data source, which basically shows the zip code, date of birth, and gender of state, of state employees in Massachusetts. You might say, you know, there are a lot of people that are in the same zip code of you, a lot of people are on at the same date as you, have the same gender, of course, but their research actually showed that 75% of all people in the United States can be uniquely identified by the combination of zip code, date of birth, and gender, which means when they crunch the two data sources together, they know the health insurance information or the hospital visits of the governor of Massachusetts from those two data sets. So this basically just illustrates the danger of having multiple data sources about you or containing information about you available on the web. There are a lot of later studies. Uh, you can find them easily from the literature. One of them is to link the data that Netflix disclosed totally in anonymous fashion about which movies um, their subscribers actually rented and a data source from IMDb.com. In that case, the researchers were also able to link this user at imdb.com with this subscriber of Netflix, so as to infer additional information about what movie you have rented, you have viewed, you have commented on. So I think the real danger of these data breaches really lies on the ability of the adversary to crunch all the data about you together and to info sensitive information. Now the problem with this from a technical perspective is we don't yet know how exactly an adversary can do these things. For example, there's no technology available for me to actually test what information about myself is available on the web. 
For example, if you want to, before you set a knowledge or base authentication question, maybe you want to know whether this question can be answered by someone through searching you at Google. There's no tool available to test these things. And maybe that is something we have to communicate and address in the 